Please let me preface things here a little bit as we get started and get the slides loaded. Um, this has been a, a great meeting from the perspective of having lots of, of active discussion and things going forward. Um, one of the things when we bring a community like ours together, which is a community with, with a number of different backgrounds, you know, I think we've seen it today where we have uh, a clinical neuroscientist, a neurologist uh, here, and then uh, we just saw Sasha up here who is a fantastic software developer, and we have to bridge a very <laughs> wide gap. And I think one of the things when we're bridging wide gaps is that sometimes we forget that, that we're not always using the same language. And one of the things that I've, I've heard throughout our, our discussions is sometimes there are specific, specific words and specific language that elicit specific thoughts, and I think we need to keep away from that and make sure we do definitions. Um, rather than get into a long additional discussion, because we had a great discussion in the code committee, some other great discussions about platform, i kind of like to take this time to summarize some of the thinking and some of the paths forward. I'll give you sort of an introduction of, of my thinking from the foundation side. I've asked Kays to come in and, and give us some more detail on some of his thinking you know, from the development side. And then we can come back and give you sort of a, just a quick sense of, of the path forward from there. Uh, but I think we're at a really great, uh, great spot in terms of, of where we are as a community. We've had a great critical mass rise, a lot of people using the platform. Unfortunately, when a lot of people start using a platform, everybody has a different view of it. I almost feel like it's the blind man and the elephant problem. Everybody touches a different part and they see a different thing, and then we have to make sure we're looking and talking about the same things. So to do that, I wanted to, to first sort of remind people of what, what is Transmart, because I hear people call it, talk about Transmart as a platform. Transmart as an application, Transmart as a tool. Uh, I've heard all these, these pieces of language uh, throughout our discussions. And this goes back to one of the original uh, architectural diagrams of Transmart. And for me, um, what's important is that it, it breaks itself down into basically three layers, right? There's, there's this part, which is in fact, it, it has the most detail in this because it's been one of the most pressing initial areas uh, of, of development, which is, we have this critical, in many cases, business need or research need or scientific need to take the data that we have. And that, one of the examples for me, which is, is foremost in my mind, is what I learned through the course of the Neurodegenerative Disease Datathon, which is, you know, we're sitting there with PPMI, you know, which has 130 different data files, ADNI with another 100 data files. You know, Alert2 and Biofi, I mean, if you look at the number of data files that need to be integrated, to get those data into Transmart, it's, it's several hundred different files. That's a real challenge, you know, that's, that's this challenge here. So the first layer is this ETL layer, this how do, we, how do we take all the disparate data from all the different spreadsheets and different sources, image files, we heard some great discussions uh, today about imaging and taking imaging data, putting it in here, uh, about putting high throughput next gen sequencing data in here. This really all takes place in this space. How do we, how do we take those data? you know, extract, transform, and load those and get them into the next layer. And I think that the next layer for me is, is this database layer. It's, it's, it's where everything lives when we get it in there. Now, that doesn't have to be monolithic, as we heard with things like HBase and, and Spark and whatnot. Is, uh, but it, we need to have a space where that data is now represented in a way that it can be integrated and it can be worked with uh, and, and brought forward. And when I sat into, again, the, the, the datathon, we had a very concentrated, you know, experience with a set of very sophisticated end users. And we had in that group neurologists, we had data scientists, we had software developers. And to have them working in multidisciplinary teams, it was intriguing to me to see how they use the platform. And the most important aspect to me of what they use the platform for was interacting with this. And the, the key application, four out of five teams used the application layer, this piece, really as a way just to find a cohort of data. When they found a cohort of data, they shipped it out to their favorite tool to do a detailed analysis. You guys all went through the posters uh, uh, the other night. One of the, the award-winning posters was the, one of the pieces from the Datathon, uh, the work that uh, the Blue Man Group did, Boris Hayed. And their application was to, to pull a data frame out of, of the database, put it into a machine learning platform, and do a basic discovery on that and they found some very intriguing results. I think that's a, a sophisticated, fantastic use of the platform, which really doesn't rely upon, upon the application layer in any significant way. Um, on the other hand, there was one group which uh, had a couple of key neuroscientists in it that went and validated a key set of biomarkers. And what they did is they worked exclusively in this space. 
to go in and query the data. I know what I'm looking for. Let me go see if I can find it. Let me do some analytics, put those pieces together, and work exclusively on this. So I think we have, this is where the blind man and the elephant problem comes in, is that when we talk about we need to improve scalability, we need to improve reliability, sometimes people are talking about this, sometimes people are talking about this, and sometimes people are talking about this. And so I think we have to be clear as we go through these things, where are we talking and what are we talking about? And so that's what I've asked Case to focus a little bit on in terms of what the effort is that we're doing now and going forward and divide it sort of into these three different areas. What are the applications? So that's, that's the first thing I wanted to sort of bring up from a discussion point. We talked a bit about, okay, there we go. <laughs> We talked a bit about what we're doing on an ongoing basis. What's the roadmap? How are we developing this? And this is uh, the technical roadmap that uh, was presented to the board uh, on Monday and is really where we stand in terms of, of development. And a lot of that development is bringing new capabilities, new features. And a lot of it is really focused here and here. How do we get different kinds of data into the platform? And how do we work with those data in different new and interesting ways? But one of the challenges that we have is that some of the scalability issues and some of the reliability issues reside in here. And so that's where we need to put some effort and time and focus. As we talk about some of the kinds of things that people look through, you know, there are elements here that we talk about as, as you know, what's, what's core? And really core means database layer type issues and whatnot. Uh, what's application layer, uh, et cetera. And so there are pieces that are app really focusing on that key, that key piece. But our code committee came forward, you know, at our board meeting and really said, what do we want to do is we want to focus on, you know, making sure that we keep what we're doing working and going forward and getting better. And then, you know, figuring out what we do to improve the kinds of things that we heard uh, from Kays in terms of stability, reliability, scalability. And that's really the path forward. The way that we're working to manage this is that uh, we're learning from other open source areas. And so the, the management team and, and uh, key members of the board you know, took a look out there and said, can we learn, you know, best practices from, from other open source projects? And one of the keys about that is code governance. And so we put together a project management committee, uh, which is modeled uh, on the Apache model, which is in essence a, a governance body that is very close to the code uh, of people that can sit down and evaluate what features are in, what features are out, um, what goes in the release, when is the release ready? and actually work, sit down and test the code to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. And so we've done that. Uh, we have our, uh, our project management committee uh, with a number of key people here. Uh, I think, I don't know if everybody's here, so key members, members of the PMC are, are, I think I saw Yanni here. Yanni, where are you? There's Yanni. We have Sherry. We have Keith Nangle. And uh, we have Ward. Ward's up there. These are your guys that are responsible for the governance of the code base. Uh, and these are really the people that are working for you to make sure that we have the highest quality, best featured uh, code going forward. And so this is the body that's working toward that end. In addition, we're working with Terry Weymouth up there. Terry is our release manager for 1.2.5. So he is the guy who's putting together the release artifacts, et cetera. One of the things that I've also heard throughout this is there's been a little bit of confusion on what is actually the release. I've gone through an, a couple of key conversations where people are working with uh, Transmart and they say they're working with the 1.2.4 release, but they've taken something in the middle of the master branch that is still being developed and isn't the release artifact. Uh, and that causes problems because that's now an active development and it's going to be unreliable. And so one of the things that the PMC has taken on is creating a separate archive with a set of signed artifacts that are, that are stable, solid, and maintained uh, that are the release. So you, there'll be no confusion on whether or not you're running that release. And so I think that will help with some of the confusion that we see out there. We're also working on streamlining the install process because if you go through the install process, I think today it's a bit over a dozen steps uh, and you have to be a real expert to run through that. Now it's an enterprise platform, you should have to be an expert, but we need to make it a bit more streamlined. As part of the 1.2.5 release, uh, we'll have in that um, a couple of key things that help you get something running to take a look at or to prototype much faster. So there's a virtual machine image uh, in VirtualBox. 
There's also going to be first time in this release. It was funny because I, I heard in one of the sessions that people are using this already, which I don't know how that's possible. Uh, but we'll have for the first time a Docker release coming as an official release from the foundation. So if you're currently working with the Transmart Foundation's Docker release, it's not from the foundation. Um, and so we don't. The PMC has not reviewed it. Doesn't know anything about it. The PMC will review and ensure that the quality of everything that is released by the foundation and is in the release site and is signed with a release signature. And when you want to come back and say, what is the, what is the foundation release? That's it. If you're working with something else, it's something different that somebody else needs to take responsibility for if they've modified that. We will fully take responsibility for what we're delivering, right? And that's important. And like I said, here's, here's the group together that's doing this. Uh, this group will change, it will grow, um, it will it'll evolve based upon people that are really key stakeholders and, and involved in that process. One of the key things we're working on is that stability issue, right? And so, <laughs> to me, one of the first things we're doing on the stability issue is making sure people are using the right version. And so that's one of the key steps for the 1.2.5 release. Um, second is, is ensuring that we have the right kind of ongoing bug fixing process. We had a lot of discussions about the Ubuntu release model, which we're going to, to take a look at and see if we can implement in some sort of ways. We have a, an early ch uh, checklist process for going through. Um, we're developing a recommended implementation, so there'll be a document with the 1.2.5 release, which gives you a set of specifications for the recommended implementation, a generic implementation, so that if you're trying to install everything on one server that has one CPU and four gigabytes of RAM, you're going to realize that that's not going to run. Uh, and that, those, those are things that we need to do, right? Best practices are you separate the database server from the application server, et cetera. And then, as I said, we're implementing this, this release process, and we're taking models from other open source projects. What we realize is that there's an awful lot of learning out there that we need to take advantage of, and we're doing that. So one of the things I want to talk about, and I'm going to choose a generic term, which is not a real term. I'll just call it next gen. Um, but what we're doing is what can we do to get from where we are today? So I don't know how many people here are familiar with uh, Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm software adoption curve. I know there's a few MBAs in the, in the audience, so you're familiar. Let me explain it to the rest of you. So one of the key things happens in, well, it's in any technology adoption, is that when you have a, a new technology, there are the early people that work with this are called innovators. They want to get out there, work with the latest thing, make it work. They understand the pain, the investment, et cetera, that's involved. Uh, it's very difficult, but it's worth it, right? There are a small percentage, typically about 2%. There's another set here that once that technology is growing, it's like, well, that's cool. I want to be out there and be leading edge. I'll go and adopt that. I know it's going to be painful, but I'll adopt it. It's painful, expensive, but I have to have the new iPhone 6S, right? So how many people here bought the first generation iPhone? Okay, so there's our 2%, right? How many bought the, the iPhone 2? <laughs> see, it goes up, right? How many bought an iPhone 6? Okay, see, it's, that's the adoption curve, right? is the early adopters pay a bit of a price, uh, but you're in there early and you learn about it and you get, you get brought into the technology curve. But from a business perspective, um, if you're going to really get to that market, you have to cross this chasm. And that chasm is going from something that is you know, uh, less than optimal from a stability and, and production perspective uh, to something that now this early majority, which many times are called the, the pragmatic adopters. This is a group that says, that's really nice but it's too painful for me to do right now. And I think there's a few of us in this room that represent those groups, right? And so the challenge is we have to, to get from here to there. And getting from here to there is not, not typically about new features, right? The difference between iPhone 5 and iPhone 6 is some minor modifications to features, right? But it's that it's, it's stable, it's portable, it works. The difference between iPhone 1 and iPhone 2 was really how well it worked, right? So this is the adoption curve that we're looking to get to, and this is what we are challenged with as a community, is taking our platform and our, our efforts and getting mainstream adoption across all of academia, all of industry, all of nonprofit, become the platform of choice. And that is the mission our board has set us on. So to do that, we have to, to work on some key issues. And so what are those key issues? We think, you know, don't look at details here, but commercial quality core, some sort of plug-in architecture, support for lots of data, 
you know, and with a, a professional design process. And so that's what we're working on. And I think we're working on that in some key areas, you know, in the application layer, the database layer, and the ETL layer. And what I like to do is, is ask Case to come up and take us through some of the thinking that's coming from, from the community, from the groups that he's working with, about some of where we're, we're spending time. But I want to also point out that here, when we talk about some of those challenges of, of crossing the chasm, is it's, it's making a lot of this just more reliable. And when we look at that application, you know, I look at applications up here. One of the ones I've been most impressed with, you know, if you talk to uh, anyone here from Takeda? Okay, Takeda, their main interface to Transmart is a command line interface in R. They loaded a couple thousand gene expression studies, don't use Transmart app at all, interact with the database directly through R. The most important application for them is R. It's not Transmart app, it's not search and browse, it's R. And what enables that is that we have a really sophisticated data layer that you can work with. And now we have sets of APIs. And so the importance for us is to figure out how do we make enhancements to getting data in? How do we make enhancements to the data representation and performance of those data to go from tens to thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of studies? And then how do we develop the right kinds of applications to fit different specific end users? And I've also heard a lot of discussion about, you know, we have to change the UI. Well, I think we think of a lot of things as being the issue of a UI, but what we're really talking about is that we need to change the application. What is it actually, what, what function is it performing? And when we get it to perform that function, then how do we present that to the user? Transmart app does a particular function, right? That it, it does that well, but in fact, it's not the function that everybody wants to use. So we don't need to do a, a new graphical design, we need to rethink the application. So those are things that we're working on and that we're thinking about. So with that, Case, do you want to come up? Oh, well, good. <laughs> I should let you come up five minutes ago. Um, in the meantime, I'll just update you on the rest of what we're doing today. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to do that. Um, we have the break that's, I think, coming up at 3.30. I had hoped to do things a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to have this discussion, take a quick break. We'll come back. And then we'll just have a quick summary of the conference to kind of, you know, keep key messages that were taken away, an opportunity that if we miss those messages to give them back to us again. Uh, and then we can talk about, you know, how we go out from here. But we'll end up uh, about 5 o'clock and let people go home early, uh, go out to dinner early, and, and have a great set. So with that, are we set? I can dance a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Casey.